And coming up on this week's Green Signals, is Britain broken? And why does it feel so impossible to build any infrastructure anymore? We take you inside the railway's Noah's Ark on a rare visit to Locomotive Services Limited's workshops in Crewe. What is going on at Euston and is anyone going to get a grip? And welcome to Green Signals from me, Nigel Harris, in the Lincolnshire monsoon season and... And me, Richard Barker, in a chilly Wiltshire, hence the, hence the sweatshirt today. I know it is, isn't it? Somebody's flicked a switch for sure. I've got the heating on, so there we go. We start with something that's getting a fair amount of coverage across the national media, and we suspect it's going to get a great deal more. I'm referring to a new essay, more exciting than it sounds, co-authored by three senior and very experienced policy experts called Foundations, Why Britain Has Stagnated. We'll put a link to their microsite on our own website so you can read it. There's quite a bit of it, several dozen pages, I think. An abridged version was also published in the Sunday Times on the 29th of September, and it's that which may turbocharge greater awareness of this essay. So, Richard, our numbers and analysis and strategy man, what does it say and why is it important? It's really important, Nigel, for transport and railways and infrastructure and why we are where we are. It's really important for that. I do have to say, one of the authors, um, at least I know, has been involved with the Adam Smith Institute, ah. very senior there. Um, and so you're going to find out about private capital and free markets and liberalisation, um, but it's still essential reading. And one particularly pithy section is this. It says, over the past two decades, Britain's economy has needed a huge quantity of new housing, transport infrastructure and energy supply. Its post-war institutions have manifestly failed to deliver these. Britain is now in a place in which it's far too hard to build houses and infrastructure and where energy is too expensive. I mean, that's kind of that's quite a statement, isn't it? Well, yes, it is. Uh, on that far too expensive point, I don't think there's a domestic consumer of energy or indeed the railway with attraction current issues would disagree. And I did notice that in the scene setting section at the beginning, it gives a couple of remarkable examples which caught my eye. Um, here we go. Tram projects in Britain are two and a half times, well, that's thinking, more expensive than French projects on a per mile basis. How about that? In the last 25 years, France has built 21 tramways in different cities, including those with populations of just 150,000, equivalent to, say, Lincoln or Carlisle. Yet the UK has not managed to build a tramway in Leeds, the largest city in Europe without mass transit and with a population of nearly 800,000 people. Wow. The planning documentation, I thought this was a real humdinger, Richard. I thought you'd like this. Oh, one. do I? I'd actually seen it mentioned somewhere else, but this makes it really explicit. So pin your ears back. You're all going to love this, not... The planning documentation for the Lower Thames Crossing, a proposed tunnel under the Thames connecting Kent and Essex, runs to, wait for it, 360,000 pages. Yes, 360,000. And the application process alone has cost £297 million. Now, that's more than twice as much as it cost in Norway to actually build the longest road tunnel on the planet. So, <laughs> does the essay go into any detail as to why it believes Britain is now a place in which it is far too hard and clearly far too expensive to build houses and infrastructure? Surely... Richard, it's only going to be of any value if it explains why and therefore gives at least a signpost or two as to what we could do to change it. Yeah, no, it does. Um, I mean, that example you just gave of the of Norway spending 300 million basically to build the longest road tunnel in the world, that's an example of something that I'd probably want to check because 
I thought some of those were in China and I don't know when that date was. So, you know, you, th there's some of those details are important, but nonetheless, I mean, 297 million on a planning inquiry, 360,000 pages. It just kind of beggars Unbelievable, belief, doesn't it? Unbelievable, isn't it? It's probably worth understanding why this stuff matters. And it really comes down to productivity and prosperity. Okay. Yeah. The authors of this report, they postulate that Britain's biggest problem is that is our low productivity, right? The, and what's that? That's the value of goods and services people produce per hour that they work, right? It's a kind of measure of output, if you like. For example, they say that before the pandemic, Americans were 34% richer than us in terms of GDP per capita, that's per head of population, adjusted for purchasing power. And that includes things like exchange rates and so on. And 17% more productive per hour. The gaps only widened since the pandemic. Wow. Right? Productivity growth between 2019 and 2023 was 7.6% in the United States, 1.5% in Britain. And it's not a general Western European problem either. The French and the Germans are 15% and 18% more productive, apparently, than us, respectively. Now, what's interesting mm. is, and this bit I kind of do know from my own sort of economic and economic history and background, this is exceptional, right? For most of modern history, Britain has been more productive than its peers. Wow. And critically... In the past, when it started to fall behind, it's been very agile and done something about it and kind of reformed itself to be able to re-engage. That's the key thing. So in other words, when it saw it had a problem, it got off its backside and did something about it. And Correct. Now we're not. On that point, Richard, I was struck by how much the essay takes a massive swipe. Maybe with the Adam Smith thing, it's not surprisingly, but at the post-war reforms of the Labour government of Clem Attlee and the massive nationalisation programme that followed. It's during this period, 1950-ish to 1980, where Britain seems to surrender its economic preeminence, certainly in Europe, and the gap with the rest of Europe closed massively. In other words, they powered on, we didn't. Yet the, author then the authors then claim that between 1980 and 2008, Britain returned to its position as one of Europe's most successful large economies. They clearly believe that Thatcher kicked off the necessary reforms in the early 80s and that Tony Blair's governments were by and large able to sustain these advances. This yeah. is intriguing stuff. It is intriguing because you made the point about they have a go at Clem Attlee, absolutely right. They also have a go at... Um, the coalition government of Cameron and Osborne in particular, and the austerity plan. Um, they kind of accept that there were reforms made by Thatcher, but they also kind of say that, you know, kind of Blair carried it on. So, you know, they're, they're trying to be objective, clearly. It's one of the issues, though, where I do take a little bit of an issue with the thesis, because during that period that you've just described, when we um, reinvented ourselves, sort of, beginning sort of early 80s through to sort of 2008. Um, we did shift from an economy that had a strong manufacturing base to one that was very much built on a services-based approach. Hmm. Um, so that was okay for GDP, um, but it's maybe problems stored up for the future. And, and you know, and I'm, I say that in a week when we're recording this, when Britain's just switched off its last coal-fired power station. And actually, we've also just ended steel production at Port Talbot, which I think is you know, a, a very serious matter. Now, notwithstanding <clears throat> all of that, post-2008, the authors of this report believe everything's gone backwards, pretty much literally. And I think that the heart of that, what they're saying is the austerity plans of Cameron and Osborne, together with Britain's inability to fix what the authors call the disastrous land planning and development policies. Now, this this absolutely gripped me because they estimate if Britain had continued to grow in line with the trend that we'd seen between 1979 and 2008, okay, we would be 24.8, so virtually 25% more productive today than we are. Okay? That's not a small number, is it? Well, no, it's not. And if you kind of sat there going, well, what does that mean for me? I'll tell you what it means for you. It means that um, if we'd continued 
continued working the same hours annually, each of us, it would mean a GDP per capita of £41,800 instead of the £33,500 that it is. That's massive. So that would have made the typical family £8,700 better off before taxes and transfers. Tax revenues would have been one point, virtually £1.3 billion instead of just over the billion that they are, assuming tax rates were constant in both scenarios. That means instead of a deficit of £85 billion, on current spending would actually have a surplus of 170 billion, meaning taxes could be lower and services could be better funded. Now, as I say, I've not checked the numbers, but the principles are, if the growth had continued at the rate it was doing before 2008, after 2008, we would have been materially better off as a country. So notwithstanding the irony that an incoming Conservative government sort of reversed some progress being made by the Labour government, um, of Tony Blair and Gordon Brown, surely we've got to allow for the global financial crisis in 2008, which brought the roof down on everybody's head, didn't it? And then more recently, we've had COVID. Surely they've played a part. Yeah, but but they've played a part for everybody, right? So those, yeah, true. You know, so those numbers talk about the US and Germany and France. They had COVID too, right? And they just kind of, I suppose if I can use the vernacular, they just sort of cracked on really and sorted it out. I mean, we've had an unusual thing, piece of self-inflicted harm, huh. he says, without trying to be too political about it. We've had Brexit. But actually, if you read the report, yes, they say Brexit's had an impact, but it's not had as big an impact as what we've just talked about in terms of that loss of productivity over a long period of time. So it's, you know, you, I don't think we can hide behind the fact that, oh, yes, there's been all these global um, things because global things impact everybody globally. And others did better. And, and the fact that there was um, COVID was less important and the lack of investment, which we just keep coming back to, don't we? That's certainly what they say, yeah. But you've still not answered the question as to why it costs so much to just build stuff in Britain and what can be done about it. Rachel Reeves has been banging on about investment as recently as last week. Is Labour going to turn the tap on at last and usher in a new era of investment? For example, Britain clearly does invest at a lower rate than most other advanced countries. According to this paper, in 2022, France spent across both public bodies and private companies 26%, a quarter of its GDP, its national earnings, on physical capital investment. Germany, 25%. OECD members, 23% on average. The United Kingdom, just 19%. The total capital stock of the UK is lower now than it was in 2016. By comparison, it is 14% higher on average across the rest of the G7. That's pretty damning, isn't it? And it starts to explain why there's such stress around HS2 and other big projects. Yeah. And and actually it is damning. And but it's also a situation that's really been present for a long, long time. And you go back to that Clem Attlee point about the the government, the post-war government. And you know, Labour, if you're listening, beware of repeating the same mistakes. So what what they did in the 50s was it nationalized everything in sight and then promptly invested literally nothing. I mean, there was like chronic un underinvestment in um in the things that they nationalized, okay? What they did do, and and they kind of, and successive governments, is not just the Labour government of the 50s, it's every successive government. They get captured in the headlights of short-term um, consumption issues and sort of fund those because that's the kind of the political zeitgeist. That's the thing that hurts them. So, but they don't invest for the long term. So a brilliant example of that is the NHS, right? which despite the fact its operational budget climbs higher and higher and higher, it still has, apparently, according to the report, the fewest MRI and CT scanners of any developed country's healthcare system. Now, again, haven't checked that out to be absolutely certain of what they mean by a developed country's healthcare system, but it's still absolutely right that we just obsess about the short term and not think about the... Um, Long term. Now, to your question about transport infrastructure, you know, how, why do we not do it? Um, the essay does go into some detail as to why it believes that transport infrastructure costs are too high. 
Um, some of which, some of these factors have been significantly exacerbated in the last couple of decades. Here's some of the examples they give, Nigel. We gold plate designs. We spend <laughs> extra billions on features that don't <laughs> enhance functionality, right? And there are loads just. of examples of that. Um, I, I, did, I did smile at this, and there'll be people getting ready on the keyboards with this one. We waste money on newt and bat surveys <laughs> and other environmental assessments. Start your like, engines. <laughs> well, indeed. Like the 18,000 pages costing £32 million reopening three miles of track for the Bristol to Portishead Rail Is that right? Cost, it actually hasn't yet reopened, so that, I think that's the point, isn't it? Um, it does point out the Jubilee Line Extension's environmental statement in the early 90s was just 400 pages long. Right? Um, HS2 required to dig a hundred, you know, whatever it is, 105 kilometers of tunnel, um, between London and Birmingham to avoid disturbing, um, uh, local people and landscape. We have the excessive consultation you just mentioned about uh, lower Thames crossing. We have feast and famine. So whereas other countries keep a steady beat going, we tend not to do that. And all these issues lead to very high borrowing costs for the en any engineering company that's contracted to do it. I was amazed by this. Two thirds of the cost of Hinkley Point C is financing the project. No. Yeah. Um, so um, now th all these points have been made by lots of people, right? But what this essay does is it is it says all these proximate causes, right, which is kind of almost like a cause related to the root um, the root of this, it says, is the excessive centralization of funding and consenting, that means planning, approving, managing oversight, whatever you want to call it, of infrastructure in the national government that has steadily taken place since the sort of the 1990s. We used to we used to devolve it. We used to have a better system of getting these things done. Now we've centralized, we've sucked it all into the middle. And the various ways in which British infrastructure projects have become increasingly slow you know, expensive are all part of that. And the fear is this government seems to want to go on a track of pulling it even closer into the center. Depressing, isn't it? <clears throat> and reading through that, listening to you read through that list, Richard, there's certainly a lot of resonance in probably each and every bullet point that, um, that you went past, whether it's gold plating or consultations and high borrowing costs. We've, we've seen them all so many times, haven't we? Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> cutting through it all, is a solution to dev devolve decision making and relax the rules on capital. But you know, people don't give up power or control easily. Certainly not the treasury. No, no, they don't. No, that's a very um, no, that's a very fair point. Um, I mean, the guys who've written this report do have a solution, right? Um, I suppose it's a multi-part solution. They believe fundamentally that we've almost banned investment in this country and we've got to unban it ban to do the that, investment that's a heck <laughs> yeah, of yeah, an no, expression isn't it and then we've got to remove the, the barriers you've got to say no it's okay to invest now um so they do talk about dissolved decision making and accountability which comes with fiscal accountability there's an interesting little case study in the report about the madrid madrid metro where madrid city region invested in its own metro to great effect because it was an existential threat to them if they messed up the cost management of the project. Really? Whereas if it's sat in some sort of white hall bureaucracy, oh. it doesn't have the same existential threat. So they talk, I mean, they talk about devolved decision-making and management, but fiscal accountability, I think it's very important. And then they call for a root and branch review of planning rules which from what oh. i can see basically means chucking it all in the bin but right? i've been hearing saying, that all my professional work in life richard yeah no i know but but they're saying this is the this is the problem now if you i mean you used to be back in the day <laughs> say back in the day if you want to get a railway new railway line built you petitioned a for a private act of parliament um it was debated in the house that's what gave you the powers to go and do it and then you went and did it now Every agency, every, you know, everybody can object, everybody can get, and it just gets bogged, mired in, in bureaucracy. So that's what they're calling for. And even the when problem, you do that, though, a single prime minister on a whim over a minibar one night can scrap it. Yeah, no, they don't even talk about that, but that's also a fair point. The problem is all of this is kind of countercultural to a treasury that, that I think believe that unless they control it, it'll all get messed up. And there's some truth in that if you look at the past 
20, 30 years, but you've got to empower people and, and let this stuff happen. Because if we don't do it, this stagnation will um, continue. So mm, I think my worry is that this government at the moment seems to, they understand the need for investment. Rachel Reeves said exactly that. Um, but I'm, I'm not sure the things you need to do to unblock the system are ones that are currently on their agenda. So you've got a Labour government who seem hell-bent on nationalising everything at the moment, um, which, according to what you've said, would mean more bureaucracy, less private sector capital, and think words like profits and shareholders have allowed, been allowed to become dirty words, which I think is very dangerous, with a worsening focus on consumption, not investment. However, Mr. Bowker, I have to hold your feet to the fire at this point. Ooh, um, really? I'm sure there are lots of listeners out there saying, oh, well, Bowker, you know, his, his private sector experience, of course he's going to side with an Adam Smith Institute-flavoured report. It's going to be meat and drink to him. However, you thought that the Labour Party, as I did, as Green Signals did collectively, rail policy was a good idea, which is bringing in train operators back in-house. Is there not a bit of, shall we say, conflict between the two sides of your brain there? Oh, well, there probably is conflict between the two the, the multiple parts of my brain i don't deny that but on this point no i don't think so um but it's a fair challenge right so the thing about the great the get britain moving um plan that i thought was sound and still think would have been sound if they'd done it but they haven't is to create a directing mind for ah. in particular day-to-day -day operations to create a safe boring reliable and predictable railway okay and it doesn't really matter to me at one level whether it's public or private it's structure and direction that really matters for that and that's anyway fundamentally consumption isn't it because the train operating companies now aren't investing in any capital really no. it's all about day to day so so um no it's a fair challenge but that's the reason why i felt very supportive of what was outlined in the Get Britain Moving policy, which was immediate and directive. We're and going to do it from day one, all that stuff. And very disappointed with the fact that I don't think it's really happened. It's... Um, <clears throat> but I don't. I think that's a separate point to unlocking private capital yes, it is. We'll, in transport infrastructure. We'll markets. come back yeah. to that. And um, yeah. if 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 you'll forgive the expression, my lord, you always bang on about there being two sources of money for the railway, and you're not wrong, um, subsidy and fares. But if we're going to lever in all this private sector investment, which, again, you have told us in many times in simple terms, is just a loan, surely that's going to mean more costs in the long term, isn't it? Yeah, but but there's an interesting point in this report, right? You know, back to why this essay, you can tell it's from a certain perspective, because they talk about private sector built the canals and they built the railways and all the rest of it so ergo it's good the problem is i think if you look at private sector building railways they did it when there wasn't really competition from the private motor car and so it was possible for shareholders to make a commercial return on their investment i mean some didn't of course i mean some railways were good railway mania was a total waste of time but that world has changed now so the world we have today railways i think are for a different purpose they're not there for to make private shareholders money they're there for reasons of economic connectivity and growth and development and you know transportation you know sort of mobility if you like and i think the world is now at the point where yeah fundamentally railways don't make money but that doesn't mean they're a bad idea no it's just you just have to remember you have to fund them from one of those two sources of money if you get private capital involved it might cost you a bit more in the headline financing rate, not necessarily, by the way, but it might do. But A, it might just get done, <laughs> which isn't a bad thing. And if you structure it right, you might reduce the adjusted total cost um, as a result of actually putting it in the hands of somebody who knows what they're doing and can get on and make it happen and not chop and change the design every five minutes. And so again, I don't think that I don't think they're necessarily um, conflicting points. And as we saw around Kings Cross St Pancras and around Curzon Street and now around Southall, I understand with the Liverpool um, with the Lizzie Line, 
um, all the agglomeration and other benefits that that cost brings in once the railways start running. But look, um, what do you reckon to all the rumours we're hearing about at the minute? And there's enough of them for it to tell me that it's a bit of coat trailing going on, that we are going to see this. There's l- papers are full of talk about Rachel Reeves, the Chancellor, easing the fiscal rules um, to unlock infrastructure investment, and rail has been specifically mentioned. What do you what have you been hearing about that? What's your sense of it, having been a man on the inside of it all for quite a bit? Well, I've always thought that fiscal rules should be applied differently between capital and operating costs. Right, I absolutely believe that we should have tight control on day to day consumption. Right, that creates no value; it just spends money. Right, <clears throat> but less fear over capital and investing in the future so if that's what she does and she says actually the capital fiscal rules are going to be treated slightly different and we can borrow to invest in the future hooray um the guys who uh, wrote this report will still say yeah fantastic but unless you sort the planning and you do all that kind of stuff it, it'll not actually make that much it won't get things turbocharged again but i accept that's a that's a separate point as to fiscal rules yeah, I mean, capital capital in your national infrastructure is not a bad thing. No. And just harking back to one of the points you made earlier about feast and famine, um, in the thick end of 30 years on rail, that was always the case just within our industry. The, the constant refrain from the contracting industry and the civil engineering people who built and did stuff was they simply wanted a pipeline or a you know, a flow of work so they could buy material, they could buy machines, they could train apprentices, and it wasn't always like this, all and nothing. And we just can't seem to get away from that, can we? So a fascinating... Can can I just say on that? Yeah. Markets, suppliers, economies, they crave one thing almost above anything else. Consistency and stability. Yeah, I was going to say certainty and consistency, but exactly that, right? And, And that, what they hate, like we all do, are surprises. So if you can keep that steady pipeline going, it's it's that's cr- critical. And yet the rail infrastructure pri- pipeline that Grayling brought in after the Great Western Electric, after GWEP, going to report every year and we haven't had anything for four or five years. It's, it's pathetic. We rest our case. It's pathetic. So fascinating essay. Do have a read of it and let us know what you think. It is more important and more relevant than you might think on a first just hearing about what we were talking about. And once you see some of the terminology and the stuff that whether you agree with it or not, it's a fascinating discussion. Certainly makes you think, made me think anyway. And we've only really scratched the surface of this though. So do tell us what you think. We'll also see if we can get one of the authors maybe on the show. To That'd talk be about him. That'd yeah. be an interview for you to do, Richard. It's way over my pay grade. I think they're I think they're in demand at the moment, but yeah, we'll give we'll give it a crack. We'll, we'll get Steph on the job. Indeed. That'll, that'll well, sort it. Well indeed, they have the, <laughs> let them try and say no to Steph. I mean, I've tried it several times and live to regret it, but there you go. So shall we now light the mood a bit, Nigel, and move on to something really sort of very upbeat? Good idea. Back to our roots and the interest as well. It will indeed, um, because we've got something really special coming up um, next week. We have indeed. Now, actually, it really is very exciting. Um, The three of us, Richard, Steph and me, all went on a collective jolly, a CJ, to crew recently, where we were extremely lucky to have the opportunity to visit somewhere many people would give their eye teeth to be allowed inside. Locomotive Services Group's workshops in Crewe, based at what was once Crewe Diesel Depot. Doesn't look anything like that now. And to say it's a special place, if you're interested in railways, is a hell of an understatement, don't you think, Rich? Uh, I mean, it was absolutely incredible. It was like, I just described it later as my happy place. Um, We got so much footage. Um, It's all... Um, all done in high definition as well for those who uh, love that kind of stuff. It's really good, so much so that we couldn't we couldn't fit it into this program. So we've done it as a special video uh, package, which we're going to release um, uh, next week. But in the meantime, here's a little teaser from the interview we did with Tony Bush, the managing director of LSL, when he was talking about just the scale of the operation, just to whet your appetite. 
just give us a sense of scale of the of the locomotive fleet that you've got here in terms of diesel, electric, and and steam. Yeah, we've got a, a very wide range of assets. We've got five electric locos, um, an eighty six and eighty seven, two nineties, and an eighty nine now. We've got diesel locos. We've got forty sevens, fifty sevens, thirty sevens, twenties. We've got a forty five, a Deltic, a forty, a fifty. Yeah, we're a bit like the Noah's Ark of the railway, really, aren't we? We've kind of got one of each animal. Um, HST power cars, seven HST power cars. To support. All in Midland Pullman livery to support. All in Midland them. Pullman to support yeah. the two Midland Pullman trains. And you haven't mentioned a steam engine yet. And we've got the odd steam engine. Did you say seven operating? Seven operational steam engines and a couple in the uh, in the sausage machine to pop out in the next year or so. Um, so yeah, you know, it, it's not just about building them, it's about maintaining them. So we've got a really strong group of engineers who look after all of the assets for us. It was an extraordinary visit, Richard, wasn't it? I mean, I went to crew diesel depot as a 12 year old spotter, I think for the first time. Um, and it, it's, it's such a different place, but it's a bit Jurassic park, isn't it? You look, there's a 50 and a 40 and a peak. And then a couple of Pacifics and a, you know, bully Pacific and an A4 and and then a bubble car. And um, what did he say they had at some point? Seven HST power cars. Amazing. Uh, it was amazing, but it was brilliant. And they were very welcoming. Everybody was smiling. There was a lovely vibe about the place. Um, anyway, That's I hope. Sorry. I hope people really want to enjoy this because we enjoyed doing it. We did, and that's really interesting. There were Tony said there's 185 head count or something working on site there, and what's what was noticeable to me whenever we walked past anybody, there was a big cheery smile and hello, how are you doing? Yep. You know, yep. it was it was it was a happy place, and um, we shall have to go back at some point fairly soon, obviously in professional interest to record what's going on. But it was great. It was absolutely great. Now, shall we move on? Indeed. A um, bit more serious now. Not that LSL isn't serious, but it's a it's a, an issue on the national network that we're going to talk about now. Going up the news agenda all the time. And actually, Richard, I don't think this is going to follow the new, normal news cycle and go away anytime soon. And that's Euston Station. On last week's show, we mentioned we'd interviewed Richard Hines, the new Chief Inspector of Railways at ORR, and by the time you're listening to this show, <clears throat> excuse me, the full interview with Richard will have been published. Now, that interview took place before an event at Euston on September 22nd. We understand that this began with a significant number of West Midlands LNWR trains being cancelled, which meant that there were more than normal number of customers packed into the station concourse. This was compounded by the fact that the line out of St Pancras was blocked too, um, and Avanti West Coast were only able to run two Manchester services each hour as a result of the Manchester roof work. There was also a trespass incident towards the back end of the day, so people were pouring into the station and were not able to be removed by train at the rate required. Almost the perfect storm of a whole series of interconnected events, but it's only intensified calls for something to be done to manage it better. But we've been less left excuse me, we've been left less than impressed with the response thus far. I think that's fair as a bit of an understatement, don't you think, Richard? Yeah. I mean very very unimpressed. I mean, look, everybody knows Euston is substandard in so many ways. It's carrying um, or it's having to cope with a far greater number of passengers than it was 10, 15, 20 years ago, right? So that realisation is nothing um, nothing new. Um, you've got two options really with it because it will get redone at some point, but it will not clearly happen immediately. So you can either close it, which is just ridiculous, um, or you put a management um, plan a very robust management in plan um, in place to deal with the kind of events we saw. Okay, so we asked um, Network Rail if they'd done a review of what happened on the twenty second of September. We've asked to see the review. We have, we haven't seen that yet, um, but we have been told there's a whole series of initiatives that they are going to be doing, which include 
opening the pinch point in the Eastern Corridor with possible retail removal, right? Um, refurbishing and adding to the toilet facilities to improve flows. Um, I mean, no doubt, all good stuff, but again, they're not going to happen overnight. And that isn't kind of like day to day management, really. And we were, so we were also told that they are looking at overarching station management and possibly introducing single controlling mind during oh. disruption. Oh. Yeah, and I'll come back to that one in a minute, Nigel, if I may. Absolutely. Um, so we, we paused at that point. We asked the ORR what they thought, because obviously they've been involved recently with the improvement notice and, in, and subsequent inspections. And they referred us to the fact they'd recently carried out an inspection, I think it was in June, and found that the procedures put in place following the recent improvement notice were still in place. Um, now, according to Network Rail, ORR are still to visit following the incident of the 22nd of September. So where does this get us to? Well, no one expects, or no one should expect, Euston physically to be sorted out um, overnight. Um, what they can expect and should expect is that there are operational plans, management procedures in place um, in the short term, or maybe even the medium term, to deal with the kind of things that happened on the 22nd. So actually, given that, personally, I'm actually appalled by this latest reaction, not necessarily the event itself, but it's what they've done since. I mean, I don't know how to put this. What the hell are they thinking, right? Um, looking at overarching station management and possibly introducing a single controlling mind during disruption. I mean, seriously, you, you need to get it sorted now, <laughs> Network Rail, you really do. It's your station. You've got the crowd management plan responsibility and you're the lead duty holder. And as we said last week on the show, somebody has to take a lead and somebody has to get a grip. Um, EORR, you need to get down there now and sort it out. Why? It's eight days. We're recording this on the 1st of October. It's eight days since this happened. And yet... ORR haven't been, there still doesn't appear to have been a detailed action plan. And we're talking about things like a single controlling mind. I have to say, operationally, feels a shambles. There should be somebody who, in incidents like this, takes charge. In charge. Yeah, yeah. Well... And, and you know what? Sorry, I just, you've just, that charge point's just triggered in my mind, right? This is exactly why we need a different approach to day-to-day -day operational management. Do you remember, what was it that Andrew Haynes said after that? Paddington. Paddington. Too, too, many, too many actors. Too many actors seeing risk from their own perspective, right? Now, if we're not careful, at some point somewhere, I don't know if it'll be Houston, it could be anywhere, right? There'll be something where too many people with no one actually going, right, there's been something, you do that and you do that, right? Um, and there will be, there'll be an issue. That is not the point to turn around and go, oh, I wish we'd sorted that out. Now, some people will argue there's gold command and silver command that are processes in place. But when you've got a situation like here at Houston, when Network Rail is saying, well, we're doing crowd management, but train companies are doing revenue collection and actually dispatching trains. No, sorry, not good enough. A shambles. I, I, I absolutely agree. And we've had plenty of warnings, haven't we? The Andrew Haynes' comments about too many actors at uh, Paddington was, was a, a clear warning, but, and yet nothing has changed, has it? I mean, that's not the first time you sat there and said, you do that, you do that, and then the corollaries and you either clear off, shut up or whatever. But somebody needs to be in control, doesn't it? We we're talking about this sort of um, off-air planning this show, and, and Steph made a very good point. She said, well, surely once HS2 to Euston comes along, this is going to solve it because it's going to be a bigger station. We're separating the people. There won't be as many people on that concourse. And that is not a bad point, but, of course, it's not going to happen immediately, is it? Um, what is going to happen now, today, tomorrow? And I think if I was to sum up my reaction to what you've just said, there's no bloody sense of urgency, is there? Um, if that was you or me on that weekend and we'd seen all that, we'd have been down there Monday morning 
coming up with a plan to make damn sure it didn't happen again, let alone leaving yeah. it sort of two or three weeks. Well, here we go. If if this happened on the tube and we see this, they put the gates across and shut the station till as people have, have gone, you know. Now, people would hate that and it would be very difficult, but that would be a management technique. Do we need to keep people stood outside and not let them up off the tubes into the station till it, till it eases? Um, you know, we've seen things like this happen at Platforms 13 and 14 at Manchester Piccadilly on the island platform. They will shut the platform when too many people get on it, even in heritage railways. When I was the director of the Great Central doing a Peppa Pig weekend, we had to shut Loughborough one day because of a number of people piling down the stairs onto that island yeah. platform was just heading for a situation that would have been difficult and dangerous, so we had to manage it. And that's the thing is we keep using these words like shambles and grip, don't we? Um, and yet nothing really seems to change. But, you know, looking at overarching management just doesn't sound urgent enough to me. I think that's the point. I, I do tend to believe that that every situation is manageable if you have a plan. Now, clearly, if some, if an asset, it doesn't have to be, it could be a station, it could be a bridge or it could be anything. If somebody says that's just unsafe, then you just close it and you stop it. Like A bridge is a bridge. really good example, isn't it? Because it's black yeah. and white. It's safe or it's not. Yeah. If you're not going to do that, then you have to have a management plan. But it's got to be robust. It's got to have thought of every eventuality. It's got to be briefed. It's got to be practiced. It's got to be constantly kept um, updated. And in times of significant perturbation, and let's not be unfair on what happened, that was about as complicated as a series of interconnected events you could possibly have. But you know what? We've been doing this for a couple of hundred years. So don't tell me that something happened on Sunday the 22nd of September that was inconceivable, right? It, it, it just needs to be thought through and planned. And it is difficult, which is why, you know, we have the professionals we do get it sorted because you know that there needs to be someone who takes the lead when these things happen and it just needs to be managed doesn't it people might not like the outcome of that plan they might not like it if they stood out in the rain and not allowed into the concourse um as quickly as they'd like but it would control the flow through the station has it been considered or has it been rejected out of hand we just don't know i, I want to see more urgency and also as a parting shot can we please have rid of that stupid advertising hoarding and use it for more important passenger men, um, messages at euston uh, particularly for times like this no, i think everything has to get thrown into the pot on on this you know including the fact that people do now have access to things like real-time trains um on their phones so they think they know what platform is going to go and then of course it gets shifted so then there's a big movement of people you know all of that's got to be taken into account but it needs a plan and it's one person just to, to ultimately say if there's an event i'm in charge so there you go um but we will keep on at this and we are going to oh, keep yeah. asking the questions of network rail and we are going to keep asking the questions of rr and we are going to keep asking the questions of avanti west coast and others um who in fairness were actually um you know did come back to us as well so we do need to know and we will find out and we are looking for urgency action this day shall we talk about a rather nice unexpected yeah. surprise that i had on one of my recent trips serendipitous i think is the word it's a lovely word that i do like that um this is a surprise on a jolly you're trying to uh, justify you couldn't resist you're it, just you, trying to you, justify a jolly by the fact that you bumped into somebody interesting you could not resist that anyway you're right. absolutely right back off back off right what right. did you say then nothing at all was back. it was it back uh, off oh, it right. was back <laughs> Sorry, right. I misheard you for a moment there. Good. Yes. Hang on, I'm having palpitate. I thought, what did he just tell me to do? <laughs> not well, not live on air, that's for sure. Anyway, um, I recently visited the Mid Hans um, <laughs> Railway, which is also known as the. He is having palpitation. The Watercrest Line. Get on um, with it. Which is also known as the Watercrest Line. It's in Oldsford in Hampshire. Yes, yes, and yes. As one does, I was on the platform, and you know, I'm a kind of chatty sort of person, so. I started chatting to uh, one of the guys who was one of the volunteers, one of the station staff, you know, beautifully turned out, immaculately turned out in, in the uniform. And it turned out very quickly that he had the most remarkable background. 
So rather than me try and explain what it was, just listen to this. Well, I'm delighted to be joined by Professor Robert Smith. Robert, uh, welcome to Green Signals. We're here okay. on the Midhance Railway at Orrisford, where you are um, a volunteer um, on station staff, but I know looking to uh, do more roles, maybe signaling in the future. Yeah. But um, that's not how we ended up having this conversation. You've got a particular interest in heritage steam. T tell us a little bit about that. It comes from my, my professional involvement uh, in non-destructive testing, actually, because uh, the, uh, there was a particular locomotive uh, on the Midhance Railway, the Watercrest Line, uh, that was being going to be refurbished, uh, Canadian Pacific, a Merchant Navy class, and uh, there were some issues around the inspection of the boiler, uh, which, which meant that uh, it was expected that it would cost a certain amount of money. That was the amount of money that was uh, requested from the Heritage Lottery Fund. Uh, but then later on, it was found that the, uh, the, the boiler was in much worse condition than the inspections had suggested. Uh, so, so I came on board uh, to, to look at uh, whether we could actually introduce some new technologies for these inspections. Uh, to, to try and uh, improve the knowledge of what state the boiler is in before it's refurbished. And Are we, were you able to do that as a result of this, um, your experience in, in, in this field? Well, we've made a start. Um, so we've run two workshops. The first one was to introduce to the non-destructive testing community what the problems are. Uh, the second workshop was actually taking some, some real samples of boiler, corroded and cracked boiler, um, and uh, allowing the non-destructive testing community to come in with their techniques to, to try them and to demonstrate to the heritage railways uh, what could be done. Uh, so, so I think that second one certainly did, did start the ball rolling with some of the new technologies um, being being tried out. And you, you, you chair this working group now, which has involved other heritage railways, hasn't it? Yes, that's right. Yeah, we had good attendance at both workshops from, from other railways. And we're now thinking that we, we need to do a sort of a, a, a road tour, if you like, and, um, and put on workshops like that in other parts of the country, uh, perhaps bringing in other railways, but also other NDT companies uh, to, to show what they can do on, on these materials. And what's the practical application? Could this actually help Heritage Railways make the decisions over uh, on these safety critical assets when they need interventions, when um, refurbishment or restoration might be the right thing to do, or potentially when you really are looking at new build? Is that the sort of analysis that, that, will, that this will support those decisions? Yes, uh, so, so there are two aspects really. One is the ongoing inspection of a boiler anyway. So uh, every, every five and 10 years, uh, there has to be uh, a full inspection. And you can predict, if, if you can better predict uh, what the state of that is before you have the inspection, then you can do any, any remedial work first. But also, well, once a refurbishment is actually needed, um, then you can, you can better cost uh, how much that's going to be. Uh, so you can either um, make sure that you, you fund it properly, uh, or you could possibly decide to, to buy a new boiler instead, to have a new bo boiler made. Um, and that, that um, trying to work out the, the difference between the refurbishment cost and the new cost is quite critical. Yeah. Uh, so eventually, probably, it will be cheaper to build new yeah. uh, for just about every boiler yeah. because a lot of these are getting o over 100 years old um, and they were only designed to last about 10 years yeah. and they would have been replaced, we're, whereas we just refurbished them over and over again. It sounds, like, it sounds fascinating and vital and, of course, Lovely bit of serendipity. The reason I was here on the Midhance was to meet with Steve Oates, the Chief Executive of the Heritage Railway Association, who you were able to connect with as well. Yes. So he was fascinated by this. So who knows, this could be, you know, the start of a, a, a really important sort of piece of work for the for Heritage Railways. And of course, the best news is, I believe, Canadian Pacific 
is coming back to the Midhance at some point, um, yes, following right. this refurbishment. Yes, early next year is, is the plan. Next year. I, I believe the boiler is back in the frames and it's been, it's been tested already. So yeah. Superb. Well, listen, all the very best with this. I hope that hopefully we've you know, been able to support um, th this bit of work for you. It sounds absolutely fascinating and critical. Yeah. Um, Robert Smith, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. That was fascinating, Richard. It, you, you do meet the most interesting people well, anywhere if you talk to them, but certainly on heritage railways. And I've always been fascinated by what the life stories, career experiences are of the people who are doing volunteering jobs. Um, and that's just a perfect illustration in yeah. point. A guy on the platform as a uniform member of platform staff um, turns out to be a very high powered academic looking at something which is, is really important about um, yeah. I mean, non-destructive testing, is it really means ultrasonic testing, doesn't it, rather than drilling holes in it to have a look at it. But it, it was yeah. really, re and, a, and, a, and a whole new workflow seems to have... Well, what um, was lovely about it was not so much that I met him and we had that chat and we had the, we had the little kind of interview. It was that Steve Oates, the chief exec of the Heritage Railway Association, literally walked onto the platform about three minutes later and it was, you know, lovely to introduce them. And Steve was like, that sounds really interesting. God, you know, because you kind of forget that the COVID, because a lot of the work that Professor Smith did, that Robert did, was just before COVID hit. And then it wasn't possible to have seminars and workshops and get together. So it kind of disrupted everything. So it's an opportunity now to re-energize all of that. And um, Steve was really interested in it. So let's hope they um, they keep going. Green signals lubricating the wheels of networking. That's what I like to hear. There you go. I like that. That's good. Um, rather than telling me to back off. <laughs> uh, you'll get over it. Right. Go on. Keep I still, going. I still haven't got over the fact I thought you'd said something else. Anyway. <laughs> okay. Now time to thank everyone who's left us a super thanks on YouTube this week. And you all are Richard Skelton, Paul Roberts, John Kirkman, Will Wren, Duncan Brody, Alan Kirkman. Chris Exley and Alan Spencer. We absolutely appreciate your ger generosity in leaving us super thanks. So thanks very much indeed. We, we all, all three of us really do say thank you. We do. And thanks also to our new gold and silver members who are John Campbell, aka Frogfather. <laughs> yeah, I know. Tim Young, uh, Paul Martin, Fred Goff, and Michael Lilly. You can see all our members. Um, to whom we're very grateful, gold, silver, and, of course, all the bronze members in the end credits of the show. If you're not already a member, um, there's a link in the description box on watch whatever platform you're listening on. Or if you're um, watching on YouTube, just click join. Um, we've, it's been a busy old week. We're adding loads of um, stuff. I did. I finally edited the Great Western HST cab ride. And um, it's so we, good, I have to say. Thank you very much. I so we put we put one up last week. We've got another one coming out this week. Um, we let you behind the scenes what we're working on. We have some even more irreverent chats um, <gasps> off the main show. Uh, we let you see stuff in advance of it coming out. It's so you get kind of a you know sort of teaser before anybody else does. It's really cool. So yeah, clearly. Um, We'd, we'd love you to to join up as a member. So that's how to do it. And worth just reminding everybody, as we do every time, that this main show will always be free. Um, Indeed. It, it will. So on to this week's news roundup. I think most of us have been despairing of the grim weather in the UK this last week, a month's rain overnight, and it's certainly been causing havoc on the railway. One place that was affected by heavy rainfall and flooding was the line between Bedford and Bletchley, where services were suspended for a week, seven days after parts of Bedfordshire received more than 100 millimetres of rainfall in 48 hours and 170 millimetres over the seven-day closure. That's a lot of rain. The flood water affected signalling equipment, power supplies and level crossings on the line. And because of the continuing rainfall, network rail engineers had to wait for the water levels to reduce before they could even inspect and test it. And it's worth just saying at this point, Rich, I often think about those guys who are out there when it's all gone to hell on water and mud and have to get stuck in and 
and fix it all. So let's give them a shout out. They, those men and women do an absolutely brilliant job. Likewise, heavy rainfall disrupted our services between Aylesbury and London Marylebone after NR engineers had to examine on foot 13 miles of track to, <laughs> to find a cable fault caused by water damage, which was affecting signalling between the two stations. So well done them. And to make matters even worse, the line between Wolverhampton and Shrewsbury was disrupted after more than 140 metres of cable were stolen in an area that was already hit hard by rainfall. At Wellington, for example, the tracks were completely underwater. I mean, you've just got to wonder what goes through the heads of these people taking a cable out, which could be a live power cable out in the middle of all that water and rain, you know, just just thick as well as um, criminal. <laughs> anyway, um, thank you, Greater Brian. Manchester's B Network Committee uh, assigned off a number of transport infrastructure projects around the city region, totaling sev several million pounds. Good. Local devolution. Get on and make some decisions. Um, it's been described as a transport infrastructure pipeline of schemes. There you go. There's that <laughs> word again. That's even better. Um, the funds have been drawn down from the one point. Um, 07 billion city region sustainable transport settlement blimey um, that was awarded in 2022 and the wider greater manchester transport capital program it includes things like bus pinch points and maintenance for a million pounds I'm not sure what that is is that where you pinch the bus or is i don't know anyway um sail west to north altrincham network improvements 0.6 million uh, high speed northern powerhouse rail of 1.31 now before anybody gets too excited that's actually support the development of the proposal um, and to help the new Liverpool Manchester Railway Board build a business case for a new railway corridor, but it's progress. So um, there's there's other stuff as well, but that's all good stuff. What I think is really interesting about that, Richard, is the fairly modest schemes, and it's an illustration how a whole lot of quite small things can make a big difference. It's not always about huge infrastructure projects. Here, here. You know. <laughs> what, another one of your favourite subjects now, Richard, I'm hesitating to use the word hobby horse, but there you go. Open access. Thanks to Anthony John Thomas for pointing this one out to us. First group has taken over Ian Yowett's Stirling to London open access operation, which was awarded a five-year track access contract in March to start from June 25. More traffic on the West Coast main line. Oh, goody. First has acquired Grand Union Trains WCML Holdings Limited, excuse me, and operating subsidiary Grand Union Trains Limited and renamed them First Rail Sterling Holdings Limited and First Rail Sterling Limited, led by First Rail MD Steve Montgomery. Yowett returns, sorry, retains the separate company Grand Union Trains GWML Holdings Limited due to begin operating open access services between Paddington and Carmarthen from this December. Mm. I mean, who knows? He might return it. I don't know. But anyway, because um, just so we're clear, I don't have a hobby horse, right? You have several. Uh, no. I apply objective critical thinking to complex situations deter to determine um, a view about a particular, you know, a particular issue, in this case, open access. That's different to a hobby horse. All but I anyway. can say at this point is do back off. <laughs> All right, touche. Anyway, the ORR has proposed lowering the charges for passenger trains to use High Speed 1 from St Pancras to the Channel Tunnel and halving the charges for freight. This is in its draft determination, which sets out the regulator's view of HS1's five-year spending plans from 2025 to 2030. Could that help um, open access operators wanting to run um, on that line? Who knows? The ORR has identified areas where improvements can be made in the company's spending plans to provide savings for operators. And that's the end of the news roundup for this week. Do let us know if there's things happening in your area, little ones, big ones. We don't spot everything and they can slip under our radar. So please let us know if we read out your tip you're on on the show we'll we will credit you with it um so please do let us know what's going on indeed it's time now to do the quiz oh i've been looking forward to this why is that Nigel? because the words 
crass incompetence spring to mind. Oh, blimey. Talk, talk about raising, setting the bar pretty high to begin with. Okay, right. Anyway. We'll see what viewers and listeners think when they, yeah, know well, as much, when they know as much as Steph and I know at this particular point. So do continue. Okay. Well, I do have a confession. Ha! <laughs> So the I might have rise into that. Just the get question, on with it. <laughs> the question last week was sent, but was set and sent by avid listener Chris Cook. Good egg. Um, but, <clears throat> and this will come as no surprise whatsoever to all the members of my family who um, are used to my legendary, appalling handwriting. Um, I scribbled down the. Chris's question on my sort of running order notes for the show. Um, why I didn't just print off what Chris had sent me is beyond me. But anyway. You didn't just scribble the question down. Well, no, I mutilated it in the <laughs> process. That's quite clear. Yeah. Because I actually said this. So what I said on the show was, where on the British Rail Network are there four consecutive stations on the line that begin with four consecutive letters of the alphabet and i actually said a b c d um and where would the next two stations be with the next consecutive letters i.e e E and f what chris actually (laughs) said (laughs) was where would the nearest two stations with the letters be i.e e E and f but they didn't have to be on the same line they just Ah. had to be geographically near so we ended up having some extraordinarily creative um suggestions i can I imagine that rail atlases dating back to the 1900s were out on tables up and down the land with people trying to work out where E and F might have been on that line. And for those of you who put in so much effort, I salute you. (laughs) Anyway, the two answers that were correct were um, in Scotland, obviously, Armadale, Blackridge, Caldercrooks and Drumgellock. What great names they are. Aren't they brilliant? And actually, many people then said the E and the F in the same direction would be Easter House and Falls of Crackham, which would be if he carried on the West Highland. So there were other suggestions. Crackham, what a all very great name. The other one was Southern Region. It was Albany Park, Bexley, Crayford, and Dartford, with the nearest E and F geographically, according to Chris, being Eltham and Falk and Wood. That was the one that really stumped people because you just couldn't find an E and F anywhere. Um, I have to say, big shout out to our good friend, Ian Stewart. Your suggestion for ENF of East Farley was absolutely brilliant. Um, it's very clear how you rose to the upper I was just going to say, that's how you get to be chair of the transport committee. <laughs> Genius. He didn't win, Ian, but anyway, but it was brilliant. Um, so we accepted anyone who listed either of those four stations, and we didn't worry about the ENF, thanks to the incompetence of the Quizmaster. Sorry, what was that last uh, bit? I was a glitch no, on no, the line. No, no, I didn't no, quite no, no, hear. No, sorry, it was just a, just a buzz on the line. Anyway, the winner, um, <laughs> despite my best efforts to prevent anybody from actually winning it, was Alan Bucket. So well done, Alan. Uh, you triumphed, <laughs> despite my best efforts. Do send us an email to quiz at greensignals.org and we will send you um, a mug. Oh, I enjoyed that. I know you did. I know you. So I'm going to move swiftly on to next week's question, which I have checked, double checked, and triple checked. <laughs> you sure? And it's your favorite thing. It's an oh, anagram. Oh, yeah, God. Yeah. yeah. And I'm hopeful this That's one's going to be a little, bit, a little bit more taxing for our listeners. Here, here's the question. If Alana finds lavender but Anton senses heat, where on earth am I? So if Alana finds lavender, but Anton senses heat, where on earth am I? It is a railway question before you ask. Absolutely, it's a railway question. If you think you know, answers to quiz at greensignals.org by Saturday the 5th of October at midday. And we'll do our usual of putting everybody into the random digital hat and pulling one out. Indeed. I'm looking forward to it. I know you are. I'm looking forward to your guesses. Right. <laughs> I just don't have that kind of... I My mean, mum used to be brilliant at crosswords and anagrams, but I'm afraid it, the genes didn't come down to me. I'm utterly useless. It would have to be a question like, oh, MacDonald, had a, or something like that. <laughs> right, so not great with words, not great with numbers. Anyway. How did, how did I get to work? Anyway, let's move... 
On to a little bit of positive news now. Southeastern's City Beam Class 707 fleet is now complete, with the final two trains entering passenger service. The full fleet of 30 five-car trains will run on the Grove Park, Hayes and Dartford metro routes. This completes the cascade of units from the Southwestern Railway fleet, which is leased from Angel Trains and is maintained by Southeastern in partnership with manufacturer Siemens. Cascade, I didn't think I'd see words like that on the railway again, Richard. It used to be such a, a good value part. of. I the, love Cascade. Yeah. Right. I mean, you do need a kind of a rolling stock strategy, really, yeah. to make it work across the network. And I mean, bravo to, 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 to them for doing this. But, you know, when you've got units sat off lease that could be used to provide much needed capacity, I know there's a cost. But, you know, it is it is disappointing. So, yeah, no, Cascade needs to make a comeback. Sure. It absolutely does, rather than scrapping or storing. It's like, you know, diversions. These are an important part of running a railway for the passenger. What was that about hobby horses? Sorry. <laughs> no, no, well, we should come back to diversions. We'll come back that, to diversions. Because I know it is one of your... Um, Wait. But we've, we've given Avanti hard enough time this week. We'll 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 let you save diversions for uh, for next time or another time. And sadly, that's all we've got time for this week. Richard, having covered himself in sackcloth and ashes, thank you so much for watching or listening. Don't forget to give us a thumbs up, leave a comment, or subscribe to the channel if you haven't already on YouTube. And if you really want to support us, find out about membership on YouTube or Patreon. But most importantly, do come back again next week. For now. Goodbye from me and it's goodbye from me. Thanks for being with us. Mm -hmm.